Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Scott Jean Bastiani. I'm with the food team here at Google. It's great to have everyone. Sold out. Awesome. Uh, raise of hands. Who here is at their first um, cooking class at Kitchen Sink? Raise your hands. Just curious. Two, three, four, five, six. Awesome. Six and maybe seven. So welcome to Kitchen Sink. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Laura in a couple of seconds. I want to give a quick background on, hopefully you know why you're here. Um, raise your hands. Who's been to the Berkeley Bowl? Woohoo! Awesome wow. place. Uh, very, very exciting. So I'm going to give a quick background on Laura, and then she's going to dive in and prepare some of the recipes from the cookbook, which I had the pleasure of reviewing uh, in full detail. I was talking uh, to her earlier. I get a lot of cookbooks that come past me, obviously, being on the food team. And this is one of the most exciting books that I've seen in a long time because it talks about um, so many unique ingredients that you see often on shelves in markets, farmers markets, etc. And she's done such an amazing job in making such a very approachable book to look at these ingredients in a way that are so simple to execute but so tasty and really highlight the deliciousness of them. So, so congratulations. So quick, uh, a quick intro uh, and then we'll get her, let her get into the good stuff. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Laura McLively uh, who has uh, authored the Berkeley Bowl Cookbook. Uh, which celebrates the unfamiliar yet extraordinary produce of California's most iconic market, the Berkeley Bowl. Uh, the cookbook offers recipes uh, uh, on a, a variety of fruits and vegetables, some of which she's brought with her to kind of pass around and play with, uh, that are really largely overlooked in popular cuisine. I think as culinarians, as home chefs and chefs, we really get focused on ingredients that we're so familiar with. And what's really unique about this book is you're able to take a dive into some ingredients that maybe you haven't seen for a while or uh, execute them in a way that maybe you haven't seen before in the past. So Laura is a registered dietitian, an avid home cook, uh, creator of the popular blog My Berkeley Bowl, and she's created recipes from really the unfamiliar aspects of the exotic fruits and vegetables within the market. The market has easily over a thousand vegetables uh, and produce uh, items out there, and she's taken those hand-selected ones that she feel are the most unique and overlooked. Um, some of the ingredients or some of the recipes you'll actually see in the book um, that I thought were super exciting were things like the Kiwano uh, melon cooler, the falafel waffles with Armenian cucumber slaw, or the burdock rook pizza. Uh, she will be sampling three different items today that she'll speak to, um, but I wanted to please have everyone give her a warm applause so that she can dive into cooking. So please welcome Laura. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I was telling the Google team earlier that uh, this is my first time here at Google, and I've been trying to make it here for quite a while, and I'm excited to finally have an excuse to be here. So thanks so much. So, um, and thanks for that really nice introduction. We are going to get right started cooking, because um, I'm sure moments will come up where I can talk a little bit more about my inspiration behind the book, but you're here to see cooking demo, so we're just going to get started. Um, the first dish that we're going to make is a beverage. It's called shiso limeade. And um, there's various kinds of shiso. So actually, this is from the Google Garden right here. This is red shiso. And you also grow the green shiso. And the one that we're using today is called Chinese shiso. So you have to be kind of careful when you're going to make this recipe that you are sure you are identifying the right kind of shiso. So Chinese shiso looks like this. It's a, a leaf that's commonly used in Japanese cuisine. And um, it's, you're gonna look for kind of a heart-shaped leaf. It's two-toned, so green on top and purple on the bottom. So um, you might have seen chiso before when you order sushi. It sometimes comes on the plate with a wasabi on top of it. But a lot of people don't know that you can actually eat it. So today I'm gonna show you one of my favorite ways to prepare shiso, which is in this limeade. So I actually came across this recipe by mistake. I knew I wanted to serve shiso as a beverage because it kind of has this refreshing, lemony, herbal, minty scent, but a really nice earthy undertone. And so I thought, well, that would make a really great tea. So I brewed my water, or I boiled my water, and then I went ahead and added the leaves to it. So we're just gonna do that, it's really simple. This is hot water. And I let it steep for about 15 to 30 minutes so that that shiso flavor really infuses the water. And so this is what it looks like after 15, 30 minutes. And so I took the leaves out. You could usually you just strain them, but um, for the sake of the demo, we're just gonna use some tongs. 
And you can see that the, the water is clear. It comes out like a clear tea, and I tried it, and I thought, well, that's really delicious, but I can't really put that in a cookbook, like add leaves to water and, and like call that a cookbook. So I was like, what am I gonna do to it? So I thought maybe I'll chill it and I'll add some lime juice so that it's kind of like a refreshing, non-alcoholic beverage. And this was one of those really rare moments in the kitchen, or actually, it's not so rare. This is one of those special moments in the kitchen when you're playing around with foods and you discover something exciting and magical. So I'll show you what happened. So I added the lime juice and it turned this bright pink color, <laughs> like bubble gum. So I had no idea this would happen and I was just like, oh my God, this has to go in the cookbook. So um, we just sweetened it with a little agave nectar and um, that's it. And so you're just gonna serve this on ice and it's so, um, it's so nice to serve this at a barbecue or a party at your house as a nice non-alcoholic option because people expect it to be pink lemonade and then you can kind of see on their faces they're surprised by this um, flavor in the background that they don't really recognize and so that's chiso. So we'll just pour ourselves a little glass and it's nice to garnish it with, um, I shouldn't have put all the leaves in there, it's nice to garnish it with some leaves and maybe a slice of lime. So you can see it just has such a beautiful color and um, kids really like it too. I just had a, a Memorial Day barbecue and I served this and the kids like had no idea that it was this weirdo herb that they never tried. So there you go, shiso lemonade. So as you can see, something like shiso that maybe you've passed at the grocery store or you've seen it at the farmer's market, you're like, well, I don't know what that is. I don't know what to do with it. What you find when you start to bring these things home is that they're not as intimidating as they look. And so the thing I really learned in working with these fruits and vegetables is that what's maybe new to me and kind of foreign and intimidating is as normal to someone else as apples and potatoes are for me. And we should find out why. There's probably a really good reason why it's normal to maybe someone in another part of um, the country or another part of the world. So shiso is one of those foods. And let me just move this out of the way. Um, I brought some other fruits and vegetables. We're going to prepare a couple other dishes, but I brought some things that I found at Berkeley Bowl last night that I thought we could play a little identification game together. So uh, here's, here's some of them. So has anyone seen this before? Okay, great. What is this called? All right. So does anyone know why it's called Rambutan? What Rambut means? Take a guess. Hair, yeah, rambut means hair in Malaysian, so that's why this is called that. In the book, um, this is the recipe for this, is you just cut around this and take off the top, and there's a lychee-like fruit in the middle, and you dip these in white chocolate, and dust them with a little clove. It's a really simple recipe to enjoy something that looks really crazy. Um, does anyone know what this is? Good guess, not cacao. Banana flower, that's right. So these are little baby bananas, yet not yet born. Um, so uh, these, you can take off these outer petals and save them as a serving dish. And then um, there's a core in it that's sort of like an artichoke heart. And so you can slice that up and in this recipe, it's stir fried with glass noodles and then you serve it in the petal. So um, we'll do a couple more of these later, but we'll probably want to move on. Okay, so um, I should mention too that the cookbook is organized, the chapters are organized by the type of plant it is or the part of the plant. So for instance, the shiso is out of the leaves, leaves chapter and then next we're going to be doing sea beans and soba out of the succulents chapter. And the reason I did that is because when you're shopping at a store like Berkeley Bowl or when you're shopping at your farmer's market or at a local ethnic grocery, Usually it's an ingredient centric shopping experience. You're not there saying like, I'm going to make this. You go and you wait to see what you find and then you develop a meal around it. And so I really wanted the book to be um, organized in that same way where you're 
you're focused on the plant itself, and then you built your meal from that. So um, the sea beans are out of the spores and succulents, and actually, I don't see my sea beans. So maybe they're still chilling. So while the sea beans are on their way, I'll tell you a little bit about them. So sea beans are a aquatic succulent. They grow on in saltwater marshes on the coastline. So one of the cool things about them is that they're, they're native to this area. Thank you. You can actually go out and forage for sea beans on our coastline. And you can also grow these um, if you have a pretty salty soil, but you can grow, you can forage for them, or you can go to stores like Berkeley Bowl or Farmer's Markets, and I know that they actually serve them in the Google Kitchens too, so a lot of you have probably had these. Um, but when, I love to just walk around Berkeley Bowl and kind of watch shoppers examine things, like, oh my god, what do you do with that? And it's kind of a community where if you see someone grabbing something that you don't recognize, there's permission to ask, like, okay, well, what are you going to do with that? And what does it taste like? So that's how I learned a lot, um, was just hanging out at the store and kind of observing what other people were doing. But um, sea beans are the one thing that when I grab them, people are constantly asking me what I do with them. And the reason I love these is you really don't have to do anything to them. They, because they are a succulent, they have that like nice crispiness like you would expect from biting into like, think of these as kind of like miniature aloe veras. So it's filled with this really nice refreshing liquid that bursts with salt water when you crunch into it. So I find it super addicting to just snack on these by themselves. You can also throw them onto a salad. You can uh, stir fry them. You don't want to cook them too long because then they lose that crunch that makes them so special. So in this recipe, we're doing a sea bean and soba salad. And the reason it's my favorite way to eat these is because soba noodles are really silky and soft. And so it's really nice to have them mixed with this kind of similarly with similar width item that has a nice different contrast to it. So to get started, we're just, we have water boiling over here. So we're just gonna cook our soba noodles. And um, soba are actually, they're Japanese buckwheat noodles. And if you, are cel if you have celiac disease or you're gluten intolerant, um, buckwheat doesn't have gluten, so they're a nice gluten-free alternative. You just have to be sure that you check the ingredient label because a lot of soba noodles that you find at grocery stores are actually mixed with wheat. I'm not sure about the ones in this kitchen, um, but if you're cooking these at home, just buy, buy a package that says 100% buckwheat. So with soba noodles, they can get mushy very fast, and so it's very important, we're just gonna put these in the pot, it's very important to um, cook them about a minute or two less than it says on the package. Because I find if you go the whole way, they always cook a little longer after you take them out, even if you run them under cold water, and they can get mushy very fast. So typically that's maybe a, for five to seven minutes you want to cook these. Um, fortunately, we don't have to wait that long to have some already cooked. So what I do at home is I drain these, I run, I run them under cold water, and that helps stop the cooking, but it also washes off some of that starch that, you know when you cook noodles and they sit in, our, in this like glob? So we don't want that, so you wash it off. And then I immediately add the, um, the sesame oil. So the reason I do that is because, one, it prevents them from sticking together, and two, um, it, I think, maybe this is in my head, but I think it kind of creates like a protective coating around the noodle so that it doesn't continue to soak up moisture and get soggier and soggier over time. So maybe that's, like I said, maybe I invented that, but I think, uh, I think it works. So you're just gonna kind of mix those up. And then I like this salad pretty chilled, so I put this in the fridge for about an hour or overnight if I'm making this ahead of time, and then I pull it out right when I'm ready to assemble the salad. So this is a really easy dish. All we're gonna do, our sea beans are done. Um, we don't have to do anything to them. We're just gonna add some brightness and some crunch to the salad through some um, green onion. So for green onions, oh, they've already removed the top. So I don't really have much to show you here. We're just gonna put these down. Um, I can tell you a little bit about knives. So use whatever knife you're comfortable with. My favorite is this really banged up Nakiri knife. 
This is a knife specifically designed for vegetables, and that's because it's rather than a, a chef's knife that's curved and is meant to be used in a rocking motion, the Nikiri knife is flat edge, and so it's really just an up and down knife. You can kind of do that like across the cutting board and chop really fast, um, and you don't end up getting those strings of vegetables that are still attached to each other, right? Like when you cut celery, and then you take your knife away and you find like they're all still in a row. So I like this knife because that doesn't happen. There are prettier versions of this that aren't like chipped and rusted, but this is the one that I do. So we're just gonna run our knife through. And for the green onions, we use uh, the, light, what, the white and the light green parts. Has anyone ever cut themselves on a, a filming of a Google food talk? Yeah, we have good editing now. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a chef's darkest moment if you like cut off your finger in one of these things. So um, we're gonna chop those and then we are gonna use some chili. And you, you can use, again, whatever peppers or chilies you like. I'm gonna go ahead and turn these off because let's be honest, this was just for the demo, we're not gonna use those. Um, you could use whatever chili or pepper you like. I like Fresno chilies because they have the same heat level similar to jalapeno, but they're red. So in a, typically when you're cooking with a lot of vegetables, there's a whole lot of green in there. So I like to seek out chilies that add some color. So um, the easiest way to slice a chili is to just slice the uh, chili off of the seed, but then you end up with strips. So if you want to julienne it, that's fine. For this salad, we're gonna um, slice it in rounds just because it looks a little prettier. So what you can do is you just slice up until about halfway when the seeds start. And then once you see seeds, you can take a little melon baller or a small spoon and um, my little compost pile and just scoop out the seeds. And that way you get rounds but without the, the white pith and the, or the white membranes in the seeds. The seeds are where all the heat is, so if you want some of that extra heat, you can keep a couple and throw them in there, but um, I usually take them out so that it doesn't upset people who aren't slice lovers. So then um, it's pretty fragile because you've removed the seeds, so you want to be careful if you are using a chef's knife that you don't just crush it and open up the, the nice disc. So you just want to be a little more careful and maybe slice. So there you go, you have your cut chili. So we're gonna actually add a cup, and they've already pre-sliced these for me. And then they pre-sliced my onions, which is a subway thing. And then they pre-sliced my Thai chili. So I love, sorry, not Thai chili, Thai basil. I love all kinds of basil, and in my garden, sometimes this one looks funky, and I use the regular basil. It doesn't really matter, but if you're trying to keep this kind of a Southeast Asian um, sort of dish, you could go with the Thai basil. And then um, while this is kind of sitting over there doing nothing, we want to toast our sesame seeds. So I usually use um, black sesame seeds. How do I turn this on? Hold it down. Does it go up? Okay. So, I like using the black sesame seeds because they just provide such a nice contrast. You can see them better on dishes. Did I do that right? Oh, I'm using the wrong burner. <laughs> That's what was beeping earlier. I was like, why is this pan not getting hot? Yes, thank you. Um, black sesame seeds just look so pretty. And again, I think it's one of those things that are underutilized in kitchens. Like, oftentimes we see sesame seeds on breads or pastries and on salads, and it's always the golden ones. And so once again, just even if you just go to the store and pick out a different spice or something different from the bulk bins, I think you end up realizing how versatile it is and how much fun you have. One of the things I love to do with black sesame seeds is to make tahini. So we've all seen tahini and it's kind of peanut butter looking. Um, my husband's definitely allergic to peanut butter, so I tend to keep things away from the house that even remotely look like it, because he's just like, oh, what is that? 
Um, so usually I buy black sesame seeds and I make that into a tahini and it's really glossy and beautiful. And in fact, it's in one of the recipes for Treviso spring rolls. So kind of like a Vietnamese style fresh spring roll and you dip it in the black tahini afterwards, which I see Treviso out there in, in your kitchen. So I'm glad to see some of the items in the cookbook out there. So to toast the sesame seeds, we just are gonna add them to the pan and you, this takes about a minute or two for them to start to smell fragrant. You don't want them to burn, so just kind of shake your pan every once in a while and, and make sure that they're moving around. And when they smell fragrant, take them off and let them cool so that they don't continue to cook in the pan because there's nothing worse than kind of burned seeds and nuts, right? So give those a little shake. And then we're just gonna make our dressing. So for our dressing, we have some minced ginger. Let me go. I'm being a messy cook, so let me move these out of the way. So we're gonna do some fresh minced ginger, some soy sauce. And again, if you're keeping this recipe gluten-free by buying 100% um, buckwheat noodles, you could also use tamari instead because that's a gluten-free alternative to soy sauce. Some lime juice and our honey. So typically in Southeast Asian cooking, you're aiming for a nice balance between salt, acid, and sweet, or really in all cooking, really. Um, but particularly in Southeast Asian cooking, you want a little bit of sweetness and lots of acid and um, some salt, and so that's why we're adding the honey, just for that sweetness. And last but not least, our rice vinegar, and actually I hear my my little sesame seeds popping. Yep. So you just want to kind of stick your nose in it, and when it smells done, it's done. Okay. So we're just going to whisk this up and dump it on. And last but not least, we're going to add our, our sea beans. So like I said, you don't really have to do anything to these. They're best chilled because they can get kind of like limp if they're out too long. And really, you could just put them in as they are. But if you have some that are really long, these are actually pretty tiny. But some of these are long. And so like, let's say you're having someone over, like your special friend, and you're cooking for them. You don't want mouthfuls of succulent tentacles falling out of your mouth. So you can, um, you can just put them on your cutting board and maybe run your knife through it once. You don't want to chop them up a lot, but just kind of do one in half so that they're more bite-sized pieces. So we'll just add this, and this bowl can be really hard to toss in. Maybe I should have made compost bowl. that my compost bowl. Let's just pretend this we chili's not in here. <laughs> Thank you. How many bowls have been dirty in the kitchen? So we'll just give this a quick toss, and then you want to put it in something pretty. They gave me a really nice dish here that has a good color contrast to it. Would you would you typically want to serve this immediately, or do you find that it uh, does a little better with a little bit of time in the refrigerator? I like to serve it immediately so that the soba noodles don't get too soggy, and also the um, the sea beans are really good chilled, so like just kind of toss it and serve it. But that being said, I always make extra and take it for lunch in the Tupperware the next day, and it's great. It's just going to kind of lose, like the, the Thai basil will be a little more bruised, and it just won't look quite as nice. So spoiler alert, before we started the, the filming, a uh, chef was having lunch, and this is what she was eating, so I know it's one of her favorites. It is. Actually, uh, so there's a, about 100, just sprinkling the toasted sesame seeds on top. There's about 100 kind of unique fruits and vegetables featured in this book. I don't like to say exotic, because exotic to me is normal to someone else. Um, so there's 100 unique fruits and vegetables in this book that I took home to play with for the first time and develop these recipes. And of all of them, I think sea beans are my, my favorite new friend, um, or at least in my top 10. So um, I hope that you 
leave here today, my, I guess my ultimate hope is that you leave here today feeling excited to pick up that thing that you've seen at the farmer's market or at that ethnic grocery store on the corner and kind of marvel that, but not felt comfortable taking home. I hope you bring it home and just think like there's probably a new best friend that you haven't discovered yet. So Looks great. Here's CDs and soda. These will be served a little later after the demo. I want to highlight, um, just as looking over the ingredients, this salad is super exciting, not just visually, but obviously when you taste it. And being at Google, we serve salads in almost all of our cafes. And so one of the things that I look at when we are looking for really craveable plant-forward salads is how do you get someone to want to come back for that second bite? And if you think about this, visually it's stunning, but it also has uh, a lot of elements in there that are going to kind of tease that palate, right? You've got all that umami in there from the soy sauce, the chili. So there's a lot of great elements that um, I think you're going to extremely enjoy. Thank you. Yeah, this could be one that you guys serve up and have as like a standing salad in your kitchen. Love Feel it. free to steal. Okay, so our last recipe we're going to demonstrate is lemongrass coconut ice cream. So I realize that most of you have had lemongrass by now. Um, it's not so much an obscure ingredient, but I, I still think that um, I've met a lot of my friends and a lot of fellow cooks I know still haven't worked with it. It's like we have it in East, Southeast Asian cooking when we go to a Thai restaurant, but a lot of people haven't actually prepared it at home. So once again, it's like making these things kind of familiar parts of our everyday cooking can really add some variety and fun and a sense of discovery in the kitchen. At least that's what it did for me. So. Um, Coconut-based ice cream is my favorite because I do eat regular ice cream too, but uh, the cool thing about coconut ice cream is you can, looking TV again, timer. You can have it at a moment's notice. Like rarely do I keep large quantities of cream just sitting in my refrigerator, but I always have a can or two of coconut milk in my cabinet. And so you can have ice cream like instantaneously, all you need is an ice cream maker. So um, usually, the coconut-based ice cream, you just want to add something to flavor it. And I love lemongrass because it has that really nice um, zingy citrusy taste. Like it, it actually kind of zings in your mouth and even a hint of pepperiness, sort of like ginger. And so it's, it's a nice way to cut the, the richness of pure coconut milk that has a high fat content. You do want to use real regular coconut milk, not light, so that you get a nice creamy. So all we're gonna do is prepare our lemongrass. Um, I hope you're seeing how easy these recipes are. It is very approachable. So things that might look intimidating are actually quite easy once you get used to them. So what we're gonna do is just um, slice off our, our root tip. And, and then I like to bruise them sort of like you would garlic to, to release the layers. And also it helps break down the cell walls and get that, that lemongrass oil infusing and releasing from, from the, the layer. So you could just take, I don't want to use my really fragile nature knife, you could take a chef's knife and just kind of whack it with your hand along the stock. And then we're just going to slice it. It doesn't have to be precise. This is just to create some surface area for the coconut milk. This is basically a, a two or three ingredient ice cream, depending on whether or not you want to add ginger. So it's kind of as simple as making vanilla. So you can use as much of it as you want. I kind of stop once I get up to the, to the part where it branches off. And then we're gonna repeat that. If, the layer, if there's some layers that look kind of, you know how onion or celery or fennel have kind of some of those like outer brownish layers that look like they've touched everything, you can remove the outer layer like that. And then do your bruising. This one looks fine. If you have delicate hands, you can use a, like a, my mom has a wooden mortar and pestle on her counter and she always just took the actual uh, mortar and banged it on her garlic. Okay. 
stock. I use three because I like it quite um, lemony. And also, this is growing in the Google Garden, so you guys are growing a lot of these things. I have this growing at home, but mine's kind of spindly still. It's not big enough. Okay, so making this ice cream is as simple as putting this in a pot, and you're gonna add your coconut milk. They have these huge industrial sized cans of coconut milk in this kitchen. So that's why it's pre-poured, but um, at home, this would be about two cans. Add our coconut milk and our sugar. And like I said, if you'd like, you can add some ginger. I just add a couple coins, three or four. And you just heat it. So you put this on your stove. I can work this burner. This one on. And your the goal is just to get it to the point where it's simmering because since this is sort of an infusion, you're really just wanting to treat it like a tea. So get the um, coconut milk to simmer and then you can turn it off and let it sit. So what I do is I once it's simmering. I let it sit for about 15 minutes in the pot that I'm simmering it in so that it, it's infusing at its maximum heat. And then you take this mixture and you wanna chill it. Because when you're making ice cream, it's really important that the solution that you're putting in the ice cream maker is as cold as possible. Because if it takes too long to freeze, you end up getting ice crystals. So um, I usually will kind of make this up the night before and keep it in my fridge and then when we're sitting down for dinner, I throw this in my ice cream maker. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to freeze and it's done by the time we finish our dinner. I feel like it's nothing, um, it's a really nice touch to serve homemade ice cream when you're having people over. And the cake is like this big deal, but it's really super simple. And so it's a, a nice way to serve people something that seems special, but that doesn't take a lot of time. So I don't think we'll wait for this to actually simmer, but let's just pretend it's Simmered, we've chilled it, and um, if you want to chill it fast, not in your fridge overnight, you could just set up an ice bath. So put a bowl in um, a larger bowl of ice and kind of let it sit there and stir it. That will take maybe 30 minutes to get it to the point where it's really chilled. And then, I don't think I have an ice cream maker here, but they've used it, but you would turn on your ice cream maker, and in the interest of not dirtying extra equipment, I just hold a strainer a, um, a fine mesh strainer over the ice cream maker and I dump it directly in and it keeps out the solvent. So, so you basically want to leave the lemongrass and ginger in there as long as possible so that it's infusing to the max. So that's it for the cooking part, but hopefully that leaves some time to see if you guys know your stuff and can identify some of these things and then we can talk a little bit about um, the inspiration behind the book and Berkeley Bowl and things like that. Awesome. Round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, for those of you on the video, you can't smell the amazing uh, uh, essences in here, but you will be tasting the food shortly. So we will be opening it up to Q&A, which we can start at any time. I know that uh, Laura uh, has her personal cookbook up there that I'm reminding you to take home. Oh, yeah. Thank you. As well as some other ingredients that you may want to discuss a little bit, and then we'll go into some questions. So if you have things that are on your mind, if there's specifics within the book you'd like to learn more about, uh, we have probably about 25 minutes before we go into the book signing. So uh, think about those questions. And I will kick it off with uh, just some general questions that I had, which is, we get this a lot of chefs. How'd you get into cooking? So I always grew up in a household that where people were cooking all the time. So my mom, she was from Spain. My dad's family was from Greece. Uh, so we just always had kind of good plant-based food at home. We, we, we weren't raised vegetarian, but we rarely ate meat. It was maybe for like Thanksgiving or something. Um, and so I was around a lot of produce and vegetables, and then I also lived in Spain for a while. And so I think just seeing how food is such a way to bring people together and also a way to, um, a statement that you can make about how you're caring for the world and how you're caring for your own body.
body that I, that I just really got into it. So I, I did study nutritional science. I'm a registered dietitian by day at uh, the Native American Health Center in Oakland and also in the Mission District in San Francisco. So I, I deal with food in, in kind of a clinical context, but I really enjoy just kind of the, the art of playing with food at home. Very cool. I know I asked this question earlier, but just going back to the Berkeley Bowl, who has not been to the Berkeley Bowl before? Um, oh. There's, there's, there, and, and I'm not singling anyone out. You can't see on camera anyway. But there's some cool fun facts about the bowl. So it used to be a bowling alley. It's owned by a uh, husband and wife, and now there's their son. Uh, mm -hmm. They've owned it for several, uh, several decades. Uh, there's two locations, correct? Mm -hmm. And you said there was over what a thousand plus different ingredients in there. Yeah. So the, it, for those who haven't been, the reason this store can inspire a whole cookbook. Um, I don't work for them, by the way. A lot of people think I do, and I, I'm just a shopper who was inspired by the store. And it's because you will, it's hard to find another place that has so many produce items under one roof. This book is usable even if you don't live next to Berkeley Bowl because it's kind of like a fun treasure map to go find these things at a, di a certain farmer's market, and then maybe you go find nopales at the Hispanic market, and then you can find burdock root at the Asian market. But you have to go to a lot of different places, and that's fun in its own right. But the cool thing about Berkeley Bowl is all those things are under one roof. And that's because Glenn Yasuda, the, um, the original owner, he, his family were farmers, and Diane, his wife, his, her family owned another produce shop in Berkeley. And um, they really had this dream of opening a produce store in front of the house where they lived sort of like things are in Japan. And so they bought this bowling alley that was in front of their house and they turned it into a produce shop. So originally it was just produce. And um, he has always had this commitment to, if I can find it, I will provide it. And knowing that he has this store in one of the most culturally diverse areas in the country with over 112 languages spoken in, in the Bay Area, he kind of knew, well, if I, if I can find this niche item, if I can find taro leaf, there will be someone that is excited to see tarot leaf at their local market. And he was right. He kept finding these kind of niche items and providing more and more and more, and more and more people came knowing that they could find the foods that maybe were from their cultural background all in one spot. By the way, this is simmering, so we're going to turn it off. So when I first set foot in Berkeley Bowl, I saw things like this. Um, and, and granted, this is a, a room with a lot of people from maybe different backgrounds as well. So some of these things might be normal to you. Like Scott was saying his wife is Fijian. And so she grew up um, eating Indian bitter melon. So, but maybe she didn't grow up eating salad savoy. And so it's kind of cool because you can go to this store and you're always going to find something that you don't recognize. But um, when I walked in, I saw these things like this. This one's kind of a small one, but you know these can get up to like three or four feet, this root. And I'm like picking it up, like, what do you do with this? Like, oh my god, this is so cool. And, and so again, I kind of like would ask people that were also picking it up, what is this? What does it taste like? And then ultimately kind of got the courage to bring these home and, and experiment. So usually I'd bring it home and I'd try it a couple different ways. Like I'd grate it, I'd cook it, I'd braise it, I'd roast it. And then I'd see what way I liked the best. And I tried to do that before looking it up because it's really easy to kind of um, pigeonhole an ingredient into a certain context. Like, oh, this has to be prepared. Like, this is typically, um, well, it's used a lot of different ways in Japan, but oftentimes it's grated and um, simmered in like a sweet, uh, like a sweet solution and it's used as a topping on things. So it's like, well, I don't want to repeat that. So I tried to play with these things before looking them up and, um, and come up with my own ways and my own um, family dishes in, to incorporate them into. So there's a lot of Spanish and Greek dishes in this book because that was my background. And then also a lot of um, dishes that were inspired by travels and, and just living in Berkeley and, and eating out. So before the food comes to you and it, they're plating it up now, are there initial questions? Anyone have anything that they want to ask at this point? Because I will keep talking if not. Yes. Do you have like a go-to blog or site or anything um, that tells you kind of like how to pick your produce? Because it's cool to see a bunch of different options, but I have no idea like how to do it. Yeah, 
That's a really that's a great question. So she asked if I have a go-to resource for for learning how to select and work with produce, right? Um, well, first of all, I forgot to mention that, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. To take the mystery away, I for every item that's featured in the book, there's a sidebar, and it has how to select it, how to store it, um, when it's available, and substitutions. Because not only, like if you were living in an area where you just could not find salad savoy, I wanna make sure that you can make the dish nonetheless. But um, also because you might fall in love with a recipe and then the item only has a two week season. So for instance, there's a fiddlehead tempura in here with sriracha creme fraiche that I love, but fiddleheads are only around for a couple weeks in spring. So you can make that, I, I recommend using asparagus or green beans. So I always list substitutions. But in regards to your question about resources, one of the sites I found really helpful is called Specialty Produce. They have a really great website that has you know, everything on there, you can type it in and it will tell you it's ethnographic information, um, how to select, how to store, and then also what's cool is they say recent sightings, so like recent salad savoy sightings, and it lists restaurants where these things have recently been featured on the menus. So I really love that, because then I can be like, oh, I wanna go see what they did with, um, with Indian bitter melon, or I wanna see what they did with, uh, like, what are some, oh, lotus root, like, that's one of the more beautiful vegetables that you can find with, that looks like lace when you cut it open. Um, so yeah, I think uh, specialty produce, and then the other site that's really helpful is Food52. Does anyone, yeah, getting some nods. So that's a really great website that really goes into depth on each ingredient, and um, I think they have recipes as well. So when you started to write this cookbook, is it what you thought it would be as far as the investment of time? Was any surprises along the way in the journey? Anything you would do differently? Um, well, I, and I should say, I, so a lot, of, a lot of the recipes ended up coming from my blog, and that was just for fun. Like, you guys all work at Google, so you don't think this is pathetic, but like, I didn't even know that you could tag blog posts to make them searchable. Like, I, I wasn't doing any of that. I just was doing it for fun. Um, and so at that time, I wasn't thinking of it as an in, a time investment because it was just for me. But then once I signed the cookbook contract, um, I was surprised actually. It's like coming up with 100 recipes maybe doesn't sound crazy, but I was doing it while still working full time as a clinical dietitian. And so that meant like I spent pretty much every evening after work just standing in the aisles of Berkeley Bowl. Um, <laughs> because like you never know what you're gonna find there. And so it was hard, it was really hard to develop some of these recipes because I'd find um, sour plums, for instance, and go, cool, I haven't seen these in the store yet, and I'd take them home, I'd come up with a recipe, and then I'd go back to get them to test it, and they'd be gone already, because these things have like a one or two week season. So that made it challenging, um, and kind of delayed some of these recipes coming to fruition, because I had to wait for the next season when these things were, were back available. And actually, a little anecdote is that testing was also a challenge because um, we wanted to make sure every recipe in the book was tested at least three times. And so something that has a really short season, again, by the time I developed the recipe and the editor approved it, uh, the item was gone. And so I actually had some, some of my friends living in New Zealand, they became recipe testers <laughs> So it was great because it had opposite seasons. So they had like a six month lag where I'd say, okay, this one's ready. Let the New Zealand folks test it because they'll be able to find it in six months. Awesome. Yes, in the back. Is there a Berkeley Bowl equivalent in New Zealand? Is there a Berkeley Bowl equivalent in New Zealand? It's called like large swaths of land where people can grow their own veggies. <laughs> so um, no, I don't think there's an actual, I don't think there's a Berkeley Bowl equivalent anywhere. Um, there are some really great produce markets all around, including LA, but Berkeley Bowl really is unique. So for those who haven't been, please make a field trip there. Um, it's really just hard to find all of these things under one roof. And not only to find, for instance, shiso, but to find five different varieties of shiso. So you have options. They have 15 different kinds of pineapple. It's like, who needs to choose between 15 different kinds of pineapple? But if you're really particular about the size and the level of acidity and the country it comes from, if you want to shop 
you know, with kind of a social justice conscious, then you can make your selection and choose, I want a pineapple from this country over that country. So no, I don't think they have that, but um, my testers there, they were really into farming, and so they, they grew a lot of the stuff. Like, car they, were, they tested the cardoons, because cardoons also have a pretty short season, and so they had those growing in their garden, and they could test those. Laura, what recipe in the book are you most proud of? I know that we talked earlier, and there's some really interesting ingredients that people might like to hear more about, and, and kind of how you got inspired to come up with the recipes. Yeah, I think the, the recipe I'm most proud of is, for example, to use about your wife, the Indian bitter melon. So c can you raise your hand if you've tried Indian bitter melon? Okay, now keep your hand up if you like Indian bitter melon. Okay, so we have like eight people here. That's phenomenal. Usually when I ask that question, like all the hands go down. <laughs> so some people would grow up eating this, and um, it's really, really good for you, I should say. It's, it has like really strong anti-carcinogens and antioxidants in it. So I have patients that will just blend this and kind of plug their nose and drink it like a smoothie. But I wanted to find a way to make it palatable, and the problem is that I think, um, when I heard it was bitter melon, I was like, okay, I like bitter, I like coffee, yeah, I could do this. And I bit into it and it, it, it's not like coffee. It's, um, to me, it really tastes like ground up aspirin, like really medicinal. And so I, it kind of made my mouth like go like Phew. And so I tried to make a curry and cover it up with a whole bunch of spices. That didn't work, so then I was like, well, maybe I need coconut milk to make it like a Thai curry and that'll cover it up even more and that made it worse. It's almost like the fat drew out the bitterness and then it was like aspirin soup and it was just a disaster. And so um, I persisted though because I really wanted this ingredient in the cookbook because it's first of all really cool looking and also very good for you. So um, then I just kind of changed my course and my plan of attack and I thought I really should try and go with the bitterness rather than trying to cover it up. And so I thought of things that I like that have that same medicinal quality and I thought of tonics. Because I love gin tonics and tonic water has that quinine, that kind of like bitterness to it that if you were to just have it on its own, it might not taste that great, but in a tonic it's wonderful. So I experimented with recipes and I ultimately came up with a, a homemade tonic that you can make using Indian bitter melon, and you, you do it with um, grapefruit and lemon and juniper berries, and it makes this distilled tonic that you can keep in your fridge, and you can just pour it with some club soda and ice for a non-alcoholic drink, or it's really good as a gin tonic. And actually, one of the, the sous chefs here came to one of my talks at Omnivore Bookstore, and we served it there. So um, one person has had that at least, so I hope Whoever wants to take these two home and try that recipe, you're welcome to. We have time for one last question in the back, yes? Um, so while I'm excited to try new ingredients like this, what are your tips on introducing your recipes to like, picky eaters? Like kids or moms? Do you have picky kids? <laughs> no. <laughs> so she asked, what are my tips on introducing these things to picky eaters? So, oh, did I just turn off my mic? We're good, okay. Um, so I have a six month old, so I unfortunately don't have quite, I don't have a lot of experience in feeding my kid with these things, or feeding my kid these things, because she just started to eat, so we're on like the sweet potato level right now. Um, but I think, I think food is all about the attitude that you serve it with, and again, even adults can have a hard time looking at something new and, and seeing it in the context of their own kitchen. So I think it's just, about going into the attitude of fun and discovery. And I actually, at one of my book signings, a, a French mom came up to me with her like 10-year-old son. And she's like, my son never wanted to eat vegetables, but we got your book and he's treating it like his project. So he had all the pages earmarked and he'd written notes in the columns of like, like buy agave and like things that he wanted to remind himself to do. And she said they cooked their way through eight recipes already and that he was really excited because it was kind of like, cool things, right? It's not like the typical spinach and broccoli that his mom was giving him. So I think, um, like, what kid wouldn't be excited about, like, <laughs> feeling this? If you involve your kids in these sort of things, like, it can make it more fun. Um, 
but yeah, I think just going into that sense of discovery can, can make a big difference for a picky eater. How is the food? I'm, I can't wait to dive in, so I'm, I'm going to selfishly uh, uh, ask everyone to give a huge round of applause so I can eat some food. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job.